It's that you're actually being irrational if you're doing something that does not accomplish your goal, that actually interferes with your goal. So you have to apply rationality, reason, logic, science, whatever, to all aspects of your life. And if you're going to do that, then you have to set your goals and determine, well, is it social context, um, social intelligence, social skills, emotional intelligence, how you interact with other people matters every bit as much as how you derive the age of the earth or whatever particular doctrines you believe. Um, I saw this example. I've been a, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a libertarian, uh, which is like herding cats in, a, in an election next to impossible. And, uh, and I've been that way my whole life. And, and, and libertarians have the same problem, which is where I learned this, this principle, was um, that they're so fanatically um, focused on particular doctrines that you have to believe if you want to be considered a libertarian that they exclude almost all other libertarians. So exactly. almost nobody's a member of the group, which, you know, talk about small on. tents. And so people like Ayn Randians, objectivists who are also atheists, would go around like uh, assaulting people that wore, wore crosses because they believe in God. And it's like, okay, but wait a minute. I thought your, your purpose was here. We want to have uh, a, a liberal democracy and a free market, and we want to promote these ideas of economic freedom. When you assault somebody's religiosity, how is that accomplishing this other goal? In fact, it's, it's going to do just the opposite. So in that sense, they're being irrational, and I claim so are, are depending on what your goal is. If your goal is just, if, let's, let's just be blunt. Let's say I'm pissed off about religion, and I want to get in people's face and tell them that I think you're being irrational, and you're an idiot, you're a moron to believe this stuff. Okay, if that's your goal, then by all means go for it. But what, what will that actually accomplish? And what are your goals anyway? So that, I think, helps us kind of set the stage for what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think uh, uh, Darwin said this well. I take, I take two sources for this. Um, the first, uh, the great um, libertarian writer uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote in the 1950s against his fellow anti-communists, that being an anti-communist is completely... Uh, against what it is we're trying to do. It just virtually advertises the position we're against. You can't be against something. You have to be for something. And until you're for something, we're not going to accomplish any goals. And Darwin said something uh, along the same line. Since his name will be invoked throughout this weekend, um, I thought I'd um, read just a short, short section from my book about his own beliefs. He was a he was a creationist when he was in the Galapagos. He was a creationist when he left the Galapagos. He was a creationist until he got home and started thinking about this. Uh, it's too hot and miserable in the Galapagos to do any theorizing, <laughs> as I discovered. So, uh, and, and we also know he, didn't, he wasn't an evolutionist in the Galapagos because he didn't even record the islands from which he got the different specimens. In fact, they, uh, they stored uh, hundreds of, of uh, tortoises in the bowels of the beagle and, and ate the data on the way home and threw the carapaces over the overboard. If you're an evolutionist, you, you need to record, because of the principle of adaptive radiation, you need to record where all these different specimens came from. So, but later, uh, because of um, the uh, sort of uh, evil nature of the predator-prey relationships, the death of his daughter and other things, he lost his religiosity and never wrote about it publicly ever. We know what his beliefs were, however, from private letters. In 1879, just three years before he died, Darwin finally expressed his beliefs. In my most extreme fluctuations, I've never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. I think that generally, and more and more as I grow older, but not always, that an agnostic would be the more correct description of my state of mind. Here he's using Huxley's meaning that it, it's, um, it's not that we're waiting for more data. It could go this way, it could go that way. It's that there, there'll never be any data. There'll never be some experiment. Science can't adjudicate the problem. We're just simply without, it's beyond the realm of science. That's what Huxley meant, and that's what Darwin means here. A year later, Darwin clarified his thinking. The British socialist Edward Aveline had compiled a volume entitled the students Darwin on the implications of evolutionary theory for religious thought. And Aveline wanted Darwin's endorsement. But, you know, like a little blurb on the back, you know, that you get from like that. <laughs> uh, the book had a militant anti-religious flavor and unabashedly radical atheist tone that Darwin disdained. And he declined the request, elaborating his reason with his usual flair for quotable maxims. Quote, it appears to me, whether rightly or wrongly, that direct arguments against Christianity and theism produce hardly any effect on the public. 
and freedom of thought is best promoted by the gradual illumination of men's minds, which follows from the advance of science. It has therefore always been my object to avoid writing on religion, and I have confined myself to science. He then appended an additional hint about a personal motive, noting, quote, I may, however, have been unduly biased by the pain which would it have given some members of my family if I aided in any direct attacks on religion. Darwin's wife, Emma, was a deeply religious woman, and out of respect for her, he kept the public side of his religious skepticism in check, an admirable feat of self-discipline by a man of high moral character. So in that sense, we see Darwin chose as his goal domestic tranquility, I suppose, or respect out of his uh, love for his wife versus uh, doing something that would largely have no effect in, in any case, that is, attack religion and, and, and get in people's faces. And uh, so it, it depends on, on that, uh, on what your, what your purposes are. Uh, and finally, I'll just, a couple final comments. Um, there's so much to say on this subject, and I guess we will for the next several weeks, but when you talk about it, religion, uh, I think it's good if we um, define what it is we mean when we're talking about that. It's such a huge subject. The topic of why do people why are people religious or not? It, it can't be answered unless you define what it is you're talking about. Um, and so, I mean, faith, belief in God, which what and which aspects of religion? Obviously, uh, religiously driven terrorists, bad. But what about the hundreds of millions, even perhaps over a billion dollars raised just for Katrina by religions? Religion did way more than certainly the government did, and uh, and there are no scientific organizations rushing to help. Uh, the victims of Katrina, of course, because that's not what science does. So are you talking about that when you're talking about religion? What exactly are we talking about? So in, in behavioral science and psychology, when you run an experiment, you have to have um, a, a criteria, some objective definition of what it is you're measuring when you're trying to measure something in a very specific way, rather than just something, something global, which we tend to do when we talk about religion. Um, I think part of the problem in uh, the, uh, the approach, if your goal is to, I guess, talk people out of their religion, or at least get them to um, embrace science and, and, and the liberal values. Let's say your goal, like our goal at the Skeptic Society, is to spread liberal democracy, reason, rationality, in as many places as possible. That, that's sort of our, our rough goal, and science is the best, science and reason, we think, is the best tool for doing that. Um, if you give a person a choice between, say, um, Darwin and the theory of evolution, in particular in science in general, and his religion, which for those of us who are not religion, we think of as, not religious, we think of as, oh, it's, it's these silly beliefs about the cracker becomes the body and, and the resurrection, and this is all baloney. Uh, surely anybody would give up this nonsense for this grand science stuff. I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope photographs of the expanding universe. I mean, this is it's terrific. How can you accept the silly old nonsense? Because that's not what... That's not why people are religious. What you're really asking them to do is give up their family, their friends, their social circle, their community, their social life, uh, virtually every aspect of your, your life. Think of the scale. Darwin and science over here and my family, my friends, my social circle, the bowling league, everybody I work with, everybody in the community I, I know. You, you want me to give up that? Forget it. I'm, I'm not going to do it. They won't even get past the first paragraph of your book because they're not interested in giving all that stuff up. So there has to be another way around it. And the approach I've taken here, again, it's not just making nice to, just to make for nice sake. It's to accomplish a goal. That is, you don't have to give up anything. Um, you can embrace all of the findings of science. If you believe that God is eternal, what difference does it make whether he did it 6,000 years ago or 6 billion years ago? It's just six zeros, nine zeros, 12 zeros, 100 zeros. If you're eternal, it doesn't matter. I've tried this, these are approaches I've tried on my Christian friends, and so far, it, it works pretty well. And if you, if you believe God is the creator of all things, and he's omniscient, omnipotent, what, what difference does it make how he did it? You know, spoken word, lightning bolt out of the finger, natural selection, gravity. I mean, nobody uses this argument uh, anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed that, that intelligent design creationists haven't found this quote from Isaac Newton. At the end of his Principia Mathematica, Newton couldn't figure out why the planets are all in a the plane of the ecliptic all going in the same direction, spinning the same direction. So he wrote, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. 
Uh, why, why doesn't anybody make that argument anymore? Uh, because we now have a perfectly uh, good theory about how the planetary systems are formed. And so now what believers say is, well, yeah, of course, but that's the way God creates solar systems. He gets condensing clouds, clouds of hydrogen gas and gravity and so on. That's how he did it. Why can't you just say God used evolution to create the moral sentiments? That's where we get the moral law that C.S. Lewis talks about that, that Francis Collins leans so heavily on. Uh, why not just say, well, God used evolution. That's, that's, that's the way he did it. At some point, of course, my really uh, militant atheist friends who really want to push the ontological question, yeah, but what place for God then? Uh, uh, well, it comes down to this, that um, if God is operating in the world, then it's legitimate for us to ask how he's doing it. That is, can we measure it or something like that? So the only place for God really is beyond space and time. That is, beyond the natural world. So there can be no conflict. It has to be separate worlds. There can be no conflict. A is A. A cannot be non-A. The natural cannot be the supernatural. If God is entering into our world, then he's really just part of the world, and therefore part of science, and therefore part of the natural world. And if he's not, then he's outside of it, and, and that's how you keep them separate. What you decide to do with that when you engage a believer, uh, it depends on your goals. And I think that's where uh, it comes down to, I think, in terms of where we're going to go with this conference this weekend. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what is your purpose, what is your goal in studying this, and what are you trying to accomplish when you engage a believer or a non-believer, we have some believers here, uh, in terms of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.